Jesus was in Bethany at the home of Simon, a man who had leprosy. During supper, a woman came in with a beautiful jar of expensive perfume. She broke the seal and poured the perfume over his head. Some of those at the table were indignant. Why was this expensive perfume wasted, they asked. She could have sold it for a small fortune and give the money to the poor. And they scolded her harshly. But Jesus replied, leave her alone. Why berate her for doing such a good thing to me? You will always have the poor among you. And you can help them whenever you want to. But I will not be here with you much longer. She has done what she could and has anointed my body for burial ahead of time. Jesus knew that the Father had given him authority over everything and that he had come from God and would return to God. So he got up from the table, took off his robe, wrapped a towel around his waist, and poured water into a basin. Then he began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel he had around him. When he came to Simon Peter, Peter said to him, Lord, why are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, you don't understand why I'm doing it. Someday you will. After washing their feet, he put on his robe again and sat down and asked, do you understand what I was doing? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right because it's true. And since I, the Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you ought to wash each other's feet. I have given you an example to follow. Do as I have done to you. Have you ever been in one of those situations where you saw somebody do something and you just felt bad for them? You know, you felt embarrassed for them because it just, maybe you were at a sporting event and they got the big jumbotron there and the guy gets down on his knee and the look on her face tells you this is not going to go good for him, right? And your heart just goes out in those situations, right? You feel like, oh, man. And then the thought enters your mind, you know, they should have known better. Should have thought this through a little more. They, they should have figured what might have happened if they had done those kinds of things. Now, we've all probably had those things where we just felt bad for somebody, and then we thought, well, you know, probably kind of deserve it the way it ended up. And we probably also had those moments when, when we felt embarrassed for ourselves because we didn't step up and help out. You know, somebody, we're at the grocery store and somebody slips and we think, oh, I ought to help them. And thankfully somebody else comes along and helps them. And we, we kind of think, I probably should have done that. I probably should have held the door open longer with a, the little lady there with all of her groceries. Or I should have helped clean up, you know. Or maybe you're the one that drops that thing in aisle five. And just slowly walks away, hoping nobody saw that you were the one doing it. A few minutes later, you walk past aisle five, and there's the, you know, the teenage boy making minimum wage who's down there cleaning up all the mess that you've made. What do we do in those embarrassing moments? Those moments that somebody does something that just, our heart goes out to them, and sometimes when we think about ourselves. And what do we do in the moments of life? When those embarrassments are bigger, have much more impact. Today we're going to look at those two stories that you heard read. Two stories of extravagance. Two stories where somebody steps up and does something that makes so many other people in the room feel uncomfortable. And somewhere in those stories, there's a touch point for all of us. Because we've all felt uncomfortable in a room because of what somebody else has done. But before we jump into today, I invite you to bow your heads and let's pray uh, one more time together, right? Lord, in this room today, we all have had that experience. 
those embarrassing moments, those times we felt so bad for somebody else or I felt our own embarrassment. And while we don't believe that you're a God who seeks out to embarrass us, we do know there are times when those things happen and you allow those things to happen to work in our lives to help us to stop and think and maybe see some things a little bit differently. And I just ask today as we look at these two old stories from your life, Jesus, these moments where somebody did something for you and when you did something for someone else, that again, we can find some intersection in our lives. And so we thank you for this opportunity now to be in this space and in this place and to have this moment to spend with you in your name. Amen. Let's go back to those two stories just real quickly. Matthew's account of the story. Actually, uh, Matthew, uh, Mark, and John all recount the very specifics of this story that there's this woman. She comes in with this jar, an expensive jar, and it's filled to the brim. She will break it, and she will pour it over the head of Jesus. In fact, one of them, John, will say that he actually, she actually not covers his head, she covers his feet, and then begins to wipe his feet with her hair. And it's this expensive thing. In fact, one of them will tell us that it was so expensive that it would have cost a normal person's yearly wages. So just do a little math here. The, the average mean income, income in this area is between eighty dollars and $90,000. Don't do any comparisons at the moment. Just, just think about that for a second. U.S. is somewhere around $50,000. So let's go with the lower number, $50,000, because it's just easier. This lady comes in with this big jar of perfume that cost $50,000. I don't know what all the guys in the room are thinking. You have to be crazy, right? I mean, who would spend $50,000 on, on a thing of perfume? It's about a pint here of perfume that she's got. It's a big, big jar, but who would spend that? And the idea that once you open it, it's, it's gone. It, they had to break the seal. They were, they were sealed so that none of it evaporated out, that she didn't lose the value. $50,000. Wouldn't you even spend $5,000 on perfume? If you would, see me later, because I have some wonderful perfume that I will give you a discount at, all right? But it's expensive. And, and she breaks it, and the smell goes throughout the room, and she's there wiping and trying to fix this all up. And it, it's got to be one of those moments that everybody at the moment feels embarrassed for her. But then, And Matthew says it was all his fault. John will say Judas has a big part of this, but everybody kind of joins in. They're all upset. They're indignant when they see her do this thing. And they ask the simple question. Why waste that perfume? I mean, why pour all this perfume out at one moment, and why pour it out on a guy? It's kind of, you know, guys don't typically wear perfume. What are you doing here? And, and, and the reality is, you could have sold it for a great deal of money. The money could have been given to the poor. It was one of those extravagant moments, excessive moments, wasteful moments. And of course, Jesus and he's knowing what's going on. He knows what's going through their minds. He hears them ask these questions. He hears them attack this woman. And he simply says, why in the world are you troubling her? Why are you criticizing her? She did an excellent thing for me, a beautiful deed for me. Because you will always have the poor with you. But I will not always be here. John, just a chapter later, will say that Jesus is in this upper room. They're having Passover. And he says that John, Jesus knew that the Father had given him power over everything. That all authority was given into Jesus' hands. He knew his status. He knew who he was before God. He knew his mission, his purpose. He knew what was happening. He's going to come to an end now. And he says because of that, just, just a, a verse later, because of that, Jesus stands up during the meal. And he takes off his outer robe, and this is not just taking off a, a jacket so he can get to work. This is the idea of a rabbinic robe, a status symbol, that Jesus was the rabbi that where people were following. And so when he takes off that robe, he's laying aside this, I'm the rabbi everybody wants to come listen to. And he takes a towel and he wraps it around his waist. 
and begins to pour water in these basins and begins to wash their feet. And you remember the story, if you're not familiar, go back and look at it this afternoon. But, but you know, they begin to say, no, no, can't do this because they know what's going on. How can somebody like him use those hands to wash my dirty, stinking feet? These are hands that have touched people's eyes and they've been able to see. This is the hand that's been able to, 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 to pick people up off the ground and they can walk. And how are you going to use those hands, those gifted hands, to simply wash my feet? And Jesus will finish that section by simply saying, I did this as an example as a pattern, so that you should do as I have done for you. And if you've been here the last few weeks, you know that and I've told you that these aren't, this, these stories from Jesus' life aren't necessarily teaching stories, they're just events that happened. But here's some observations that I think are worth us looking at for a moment today. And the first one is this. How many of you would agree with that statement is true in your life? That you, you tend towards scarcity, restraint, reasonableness? How many of you would consider yourself cautious, wise in investments? You guys ought to be prouder about this. That's a good thing, all right? You know what? You know, you know what? You know you think I'm setting you up for something, right? I'm just saying this is how we tend to be, isn't it? You know, we don't want to get too excited, too excessive in any kind of celebration. We don't want to go over the top. We want to hit just the right mark, right? Nobody wants to show up at any kind of party overdressed, right? You want to be just a little bit nicer, you know, have something like that, but not too much. Because you don't want to stand out too much. You don't want to be excessive. You don't want to be considered wasteful. But not only do we tend towards those things, Because we are always, always evaluating. And for some of you who take pride in that, and here's something you need to know if you take pride in that. Now some of you think it is. You like to call it discernment. Which is simply your excuse to be able to be real critical of somebody else. And criticize them and say, well, that's not how I would have done it. Why, why do you think they did that? Let's think, why do you think that happened? You, I don't know, but let's, let's think. And that's what the disciples do. Judas is there, and Judas is a big voice of this, but it's not just him, it's the rest of the guys. And begin to come down on this woman, because she has been wasteful. She wasn't just excessive in her expression. She was wasteful. She, she blew $50,000 worth of perfume in just two minutes. She, she wasted on perfume the amount that all of us collectively raised during the holidays in order to support four brand new community partners to send $25,000 down to, down to the islands, down to the Caribbean to help after all the hurricanes. All of that that we raised collectively, poured out, done. Smells good, but man. Which leads us to this first point. It's easy to love when it's safe. Right? In fact, when it's undemanding, when it doesn't cost us a lot. In fact, for some of us, we like that kind of love because it's easy. And if I just do the bare minimum and I feel good about it, what more could I want? You know, I told you I loved you once. How many more times do I have to tell you that? Get your birthday card most of the time. Try to remember our anniversary. But as you see this woman get down and go to this extreme, in expressing something that has gone on in her life, it is so easy to miss the depth of her love and how she couldn't contain that love. 
and how she was willing to be embarrassed, dramatically embarrassed, openly embarrassed. Because you know people went out of this, this event and talked about her for years to come, right? Because it didn't matter that Jesus said, leave her alone. Some people were like, well, I don't know. You should have seen what she did. In the audacity of it, this was back when a woman who wasn't married to a man didn't touch that other man. There were no PDAs back then of any kind, but especially this kind. Something else. That's sometimes the hard, our hardest part when we listen to what Jesus has said, when we read the, the things that, that Jesus taught so often it goes against what seems reasonable. Because when I read this story, I say, I probably would have been the disciples, you know, as they start talking this stuff up, I probably would have gone along with the guys and said, yeah, the reasonable thing would have been for her to say, hey, Jesus, I brought you this perfume, I want to honor your death. But wouldn't the best way to honor your death would be not to bring flowers, but to give donations to some cause in your name, to take this, this perfume and, and and not pour it out, but to take and share it out, that the money would come in, and then we could help more people. And it's so easy to judge what other people do, to judge what's reasonable, and to believe that reasonable is always right, when the reality is right conclusion is always the right conclusion. When I read this story, it makes me stop and wonder, how far is too far for me in expressing my thankfulness to God, my thankfulness to Jesus for what he's done for me? Where's my limit? Where's my line that I say, I'll go up to this, but... I won't, I can't, I couldn't go any farther because it'd be embarrassing. It would be critiqued. It would be talked about. Let's be honest. We all have a line, don't we? And some of us feel good, our lines are farther than everybody else, and that's part of our problem, is that we compare ourselves to others. And here's the crazy thing about, about this. Is that everybody in this room, everybody watching online, all of us have power. I want you to raise your right hand and say after me, I have power. I have power. Yeah, some of you believe that, I can hear it in your voice, right? So you're like, Mike, I don't know if I have that much power. The reality is, you have power. There, you, you are in rooms at some point every week that you have ultimate power in. You may be the boss and you've got employees, you have power. You may be in a relationship and it's clear that you're the one with the power. You may be a teacher and you like that power. You may be thinking, oh no, Mike, you know, I'm, I'm, I don't have power, I don't have a job, I'm going to school, you know, everybody's on me. They're out. You're, when you're alone in your bedroom, you have ultimate power at that moment. All of us have power. And our problem at times is we think power is the goal. If I can get into this position, into this power, into this place, then, oh man, it will be really, really good because I want power so I can do the things I want to do. But what about, what if according to Jesus, this has nothing to do with power, but has everything to do with how you use that power? Because you have power the question for you and the question for me is, what will I do with that power? Because as John remembers this story, he says, Jesus walks into that, that room that night, and he knows he has all power. All authority has been given him by God. And he knows that whatever he does that night will not affect his status with God. And maybe that's the thing that he understands that we sometimes don't understand. 
Because if I lower myself, as the language we use, if I do the dirty work, what will people think? I'm not supposed to be, I'm supposed to be here, I'm not supposed to be down there cleaning somebody else's job. And what might people think? And my big takeaway as I look at Jesus and what he was trying to communicate to his guys that evening is simply that. Because so many of us fight the appearance of being weak. So many of us fight the appearance of not having power. So many of us fight being the one that's serving instead of being the one who served. And if you don't get anything else today, make sure you don't miss this because that's how Jesus lived his life. Over and over, he kept trying to tell the guys, guys, you keep wanting positions of power. You keep fighting over, which one of you is going to be the greatest? You bunch of idiots, I'm the greatest. But you guys keep fighting over it. And you think if you just get close enough to me that my greatness will rub off on you and so you're going to be great? This is not how my kingdom works. This isn't about getting power so people will wait on you. This is about you waiting on people because you have power. And you need to use that power to do that. Once you get that, raise your hand, right hand for me, all right? I want to make sure you get this, all right? Raise your right hand, Sandy, for me. Thank you, Sandy, yeah. <laughs> this is one of the hardest things for us to learn, but one of the most important things for us to learn. Amen. Let's be honest. I kind of like to make Jesus into my image. I kind of like it when he likes the people that I like. I kind of like it when he doesn't like the people I don't like. And for me, this is the thing that always draws me back to Jesus. Always reminds me of the right space and the right place for my life. That it's about me getting in the right relationship to him, not him getting in the right relationship to me. Amen. And one more takeaway from these stories is simply this, that when you find yourself in a place of not sure what you're supposed to do, what you, you ought to do in that situation, you ought to ask this simple question. What does love require of me? Say that with me. What does love If you're a woman who is so moved and it's so clear that God is telling her to go to this place that night where Jesus is at having this meal and you're told to take what has to be your life savings. I mean, a whole year's worth of work, work and bring this, this jar of perfume and literally break it open so you can never use it again, begin to pour it on his, on his head and then on his feet, and then you recognize the mess and you're trying to wipe things up with your hair. Love required her at that moment to do those things. When Jesus gets up from the table, takes off this jacket, this symbol of who they had seen him as, and begins to kneel down, begins to take their feet. Dirty feet. Begins to wash them. And before he gets very far, he has to stop and tell Peter, no, you really have to let me do this. Because there's something that happens when we allow Jesus to sit down and to take our feet. When we allow Jesus to, to wash the dirt off of our feet. And when he tells us we ought to do this for other people, there's something insightful that is so easy to miss. 
And that's simply this, that your faith journey is not simply your faith journey. Your faith journey is our faith journey. And when Jesus says, I'm you home, I'm asking you to wash each other's feet, he's saying, you need to recognize this is something you can't do for yourself. You cannot clean your own feet. Because this is more than just I can kneel down and do this. This is no, you need somebody else doing this because you need to recognize you can't fix all those things in your life. And you need to do it, you need to wash their feet because that's not only good for them, it's good for you to recognize that I'm there to try to keep cleaning, help clean things up, help clean things up, help clean things up. In just a moment, I'm going to invite you to, to uh, follow the directions of our deacons, and you're going to come from the back and come down front and grab some uh, the bread and the juice for our chance to celebrate communion here in just a few moments. But here's the thing I want to encourage you to have in your mind as you take those steps today. Simply ask yourself that question. Because what love requires of you may not be what love requires of me. And what love requires of me may not be what love requires of you. And what love requires of us is for us to recognize how much we need each other and how we're in this together and how we can be helpful or hindering to not only our journey, but to their journey.